So, okay, so yeah. my name is Louis and uh, I work on this thing named Pentester Lab. So basically my job is to train people and teach them web hacking. And when you teach web hacking, you start to do classical WASP top 10, but after a while, like you need something else. And something where like a lot of interesting bug lies is applied crypto. And so I want to teach people applied crypto basically. And when you want to teach applied crypto to someone, you have two choices. Ever you make up your examples, but then people need to learn your own protocol, your examples, and then they can't directly apply it to something. They need to translate it to their other protocols. So it's not ideal. So you need to find something that works perfectly to teach applied crypto. And for a while, I didn't have that until I found out about JWT. And it's an amazing way to learn applied crypto. Trust me on that. Uh, especially if you're like me, like uh, Yanak, I'm not a cryptographer. Uh, yeah, I'm not a mathematician at all. I just like applied crypto. Uh, what else? Oh, I make stickers and I got plenty. So if you want stickers, just yell that after the talk. So who is using JWT? So a lot of people are using JWT for OAuth. And basically, if you use the internet, you're using JWT pretty much every day. You may not know about it, but you are. Trust me on that. Like everyone is using it. If you want signed information, so for example, uh, you want to give someone information and make sure they're not going to tamper with it. JWT are pretty good for that. If you want to do things uh, across data center, you can use JWT as well because this way you don't rely on a session, a pool of session, because that can be a, uh, awkward across data center to have like an NFS share or something like that. So that's why you probably want sign information. But yeah, everyone is using it. So um, acronyms you're gonna, I'm going to talk about. So first. Uh, Jose, that's the working group who created JWT. We should be thankful for them because they created something amazing to teach applied crypto. Uh, JWT or JOT J token. So that's the common name used to talk about those token. And you can talk about JWE for encrypted one or JWS for signed token. And you're, we're also going to come across uh, JWK for JSON web key and JWA for the, the JSON web algorithm. So Crypto 101, uh, just in case there are some pen testers in the, in the room. Tough crowd. <laughs> uh, I'm a pen tester myself. So. Uh, encryption gives you confidentiality and signature gives you integrity. That's really important because sometimes people get things mixed up. Yes? Sorry, super passionate crypto person. Yeah. So encryption also gives privacy, homomorphism. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you. <laughs> so when you want to sign information, you can uh, sign uh, with a secret using HMAC, or you can sign with a private key using RSA, EC, or something similar. So symmetric versus asymmetric ways of signing. Uh, if you sign with a secret, both parties, so the creator of the secret of the information and the person signing, and the person verifying the secret needs the, uh, verifying the data needs a secret to verify the integrity of the data. So if you are like, you say, oh, that's not ideal. So what people do is often they use asymmetric. So the person signing just needs a private key and the person verifying just needs a public key. So it's a lot better. But oh, I'm going to get to it. So if you look into JSON, probably everyone saw JSON at least once in their life, hopefully. So it's this way of structuring information. You can have int, you can have array, you can have ashes, you can have string, everything you want. And JWT or JWS are using JSON internally. So if you look at the JWT token, you have three parts, header, payload, and signature. They divide it by a dot, so you got two dots. And then inside that, you have Base64 encoded JSON. So it's not actually Base64, is Base64 encoding, uh, URL safe Base64 encoding without padding. So if we look at Base64, of JSON, so something with, that will start with a curly bracket and a double quote. You can see that it's AYJ, so that's why when you see a token that does AYJ something dot AYJ something dot base64, you have JWT. So that's a good way to detect them. 
So I said it was not really J uh, Base64. It's actually Base64 URL encoding without padding. So basically, a Base64 version that works really well with HTTP, because you're going to put your JWT in URL, in cookie, in header. So you need something that doesn't have equal sign, that doesn't have slash, because that's going to break, if you have a slash, that's going to break uh, URI, for example. So you just take your uh, Base64 information, you remove the padding, so the equal sign. You change a plus by a dash, because a plus is uh, a space in HTTP. And you replace the slash with an underscore. So the header, the first part, contains two things. So the type of the token and the algorithm. And the algorithm basically tells the person verifying the token how this was signed. You have multiple algorithms. So you got all the HMAC family here. You got the RSA1, elliptic curve, and a PS family, which is uh, RSA with fancy padding. Let's call that in. Uh, yeah. And then if you look at uh, JWT format and why would you want so many algorithms, right? It seems like overcomplicated. So if you are, for example, you're using HMAC, every service, and you got like one client and it talks to many microservices, every single mi microservices needs the key to verify the token. So if one of your uh, microservices get popped, they're all popped pretty much, because then you can forge your own token and it's kind of game over. If you're using uh, asymmetric, what you can do is share the key, both the key everywhere, and you back to the HMAC case. If you want to be a bit smarter about it, you can have one service that you trust, for example, your login microservice, and that has the private key, so it's the only one that can sign token, and everyone else has just access to the public key, so they can just verify a token. And if one of them gets popped, you're in trouble because someone is in your network, but they can't sign token at least. And asymmetric, the good thing is that you can even put the key in the browser, so uh, the public key, obviously. So this way you can uh, access the token and be sure that it's safe or it's information that you sign inside that token. For example, if you want to do a redirect based on information in the token, that allows you to do that. Why? Isn't everybody using asymmetric? Because it's harder to deploy and also uh, performance wise. It takes a lot more uh, power to verify a symmetric, uh, an asymmetric signature than a symmetric signature. Now we move to the next part the payload. So it's basically whatever you want to put in it uh, username, roles, whatever. You put whatever, just JSON. Uh, you have reserved claims that are part of the body. So issuer, subject, audience, JTI, uh, expiry, really important um, because you want your token, when you sign something, you really, really want this token to expire after a while. Otherwise, it's going to be valid forever, so you can't have repudiation, for example. Um, why do we have expiry and issue at? The good thing is that, let's say you have multiple microservices, and one of them uh, is asynchronous and takes five days to process token. If you were to use expiry, you, may, you will have to, do, to use expiry everywhere, and your token will last for five days. With issue at, you can say, OK, um, I issue the token at that point in time. So for these microservices, you can trust them for two hours, and this one will trust them for five days. So that's why it's good to mix them up. GTI, uh, claim ID, is used to prevent replay. So people use that. They put like a big UID inside it or something random. So they make sure that you can't replace the same token again and again and again. And what do you do when you create a JWT? First, you create the JSON header with the algorithm. You encode it uh, you, as JSON, and then you base64 encode it. Then you create the body. You base64 encode it. Uh, then you sign the header plus a dot plus the payload, so, which is important because you're actually signing the header. People often get that mistake that only the payload is signed. Everything is signed. Then you base 64 encode the signature, and you append a dot and then the signature. When you're verifying a token, you get the token. You split it in three parts. Then you base 64 decode each part. Then you pass the JSON. Uh, then you retrieve the algorithm from the header. And then finally, you do some crypto to verify that everything is good. So you basically have a lot of surface here to attack, which is one of the big problems with JWT and why a lot of people don't like them. 
And then once you verify the signature, if the signature is valid, you verify the claims to say like, okay, is this token, for example, still valid? Um, keep in mind as well that multiple systems can use uh, tokens. So for example, if you're attacking an app that has like a lot of microservices, it's good to do like the test against every single microservice because some may have different behavior. Um, different libraries have different behavior. So yeah, it's a lot of testing. And most of the time when you're attacking just on web token, your goal is to bypass the signature mechanism and modify the untamper with the token. So one of the main bugs you can find, and if you're really lucky, is people are not checking the signature at all. For example, in JavaScript, you got, um, I don't remember the name of the library, but you got this library that has two methods. One is decode and the other one is verify. And you don't want to use decode because it doesn't verify. And or people just like disable the check for the, of the signature and then forget to put it back. So that happened from time to time. And if that happens, you just get a token, tamper with it, and send it back. And for example, you can change your username from test to admin. Then, as part of the, I quickly talk about that, the non-algorithm. I didn't talk about it because I want to keep that for now, actually. So basically, there is a non-algorithm, and you may, which is basically we don't sign the token. It may look crazy, but if you look at, for example, TLS or SSL, SSL used to have that with the null cipher and, uh, yeah, with the null cipher, basically to debug, to help people debugging. The problem is that people, when they implemented the spec, they just put it in, and some libraries, you were just able to just use none. And even if your application wasn't using token with none, you could just send your token with the none, and it was, and you could get in and tamper with the value. But that got fixed. But, so if you want to exploit that, you get a token, you decode the header, you change the algorithm from whatever, HS256 to none, and then you tamper with the payload and you keep, uh, or remove the signature depending on the implementation of the library. You may need to remove it, you may need to keep it, and then you profit. Uh, little pirate boat, because we're all pirates. Uh, so hopefully, we're gonna... Oh, both, both. Even the server, yeah. Oh, yeah, oh, so yeah, when you send it back, yeah. Oh, the issue, no, thank God. Oh, they may actually, but yeah, like, yeah, no, the issue is, yeah, sorry. Uh, uh, so, like, uh, we got a little app here. We reload, we register, test, test, test. We got token in our cookie here. We copy it. Uh, uh, yeah. So, you got. The first part, ah, sorry, it's stupid Mac keyboard. You get the value here. You copy that part. You change that guy from HS. So they were, the application is using HMAC. Uh, that's not good. Uh, base 64 encode it, boom, uh, get back into VI, change the first value, now you move to, uh, move to the second value, oh. I hope, uh, yeah, you copy that part, uh. so, this one is interesting uh, because, see I was talking about this padding thing, and here you can see the uh, IN0, and we can see that here the JSON is not properly formatted, it's because the padding is missing. So if you add it back, uh, if you add back the equal sign, now you got the full JSON. So you can just take that, Uh, probably a good idea to change my username. Oh, what's going on? I'm gonna be admin today. Yeah, up. You change that part, you go there, uh, you remove the signature, up. You copy everything, you, and, 
and you reload, and yeah, you admin. So basically, yeah, just by changing the algorithm and the value, you can change after that everything in the application. And the, like, what is interesting is as a developer, you're not aware of that. You're not, you didn't pick that algorithm. It was defined by the library, and the library supports it, and that's how you get done. Now, another one pretty common is weak secret. So the, the, if you're using HMAX, the secret of, or even if you're using RSA, actually, the secret of the strength of the signature relies on the strength of the secret. And the good thing with that is that that can be cracked offline. It's not like you're brute forcing a web form. You just get a token, running it Ashcat for like two months, three months, and then get the secret, and then you forge your own token. So if you're doing forensic of, and someone does this kind of attack against your system, you only see two requests, someone logging in with a normal account, and then someone accessing the application as admin. So basically, you don't have any logs. And as people say, no logs, no crime. <laughs> That's when you can tell Luis from law enforcement in the room. And so, yeah, example of weak secret. So this is from uh, a boilerplate, like someone who put like frameworks together to create uh, an easy way to create applications. So basically, if the application is not in production mode, uh, easy in production mode, you're going to use the uh, environment JWT secret, underscore secret, otherwise use the string secret. So basically, if you're not in the right environment, and some people don't always run production uh, mode outside of production, and even, so the library, the, and this library will check that this secret is, uh, is not empty, but you can imagine that you deploy your library and you mess it up, and you de don't define this value, and you end up with like an empty string, for example. So, but in this case, this is going to prevent the empty string. But still, like, pretty bad pattern. Uh, so you get a token, you brute force the token, uh, the secret offline, and then you tamper with the payload and you resign it using the secret. Pretty easy. Algorithm confusion is a bit more complex. So basically, the sender of the token controls what algorithm is used to verify the token. So we saw that I can say none, but no one supports none anymore, unfortunately. Uh, so what you can do is, if you imagine you have a token that is signed using uh, RSA, it's going to be signed with a private key and going to be verified with the public key. What you can do is say, instead of using RSA when verifying the token, actually use HMAC. And since the public key may be public, you have access to the public key and you may sign your own token using HMAC with the public key as the key. And yeah, and the, on the verifier side, what the code is going to look like, it's verified with the public key because it's supposed to use RSA. But this time, since you're using HMAC, uh, it's not going to work. Oh, you're going to go through. And yeah, so uh, you can get the public key from JavaScript code, come from mobile client, from documentation. It's public after all. So like, yeah, you should get access to it. So basically, you get a token signed with RSA. You just tamper with the algorithm. You get the public key. You tamper with the payload. Then you sign the token with the public RSA key. So it kind of um, uh, so it kind of looks like that. You get okay. I'm getting this public key. I'm getting this token. I'm going to split it. I'm going to change the algorithm from RSA to HMAC. And then I'm going to sign with HMAC and uh, SHA2, because I use SHA256, and the public key here. And I get a token. And with this token, I can log in. So if, uh, if we run that. Uh, yeah, so we get the token, and for example, if we go to an app here, um, if I, for example, register, test. No. Yeah, I got a token, which is really long because it's using RSA. I change it with the token I just generated, and if I reload, I'm just becoming admin in one click because I changed the algorithm to one that works better when you have the public key. But that, again, it's really hard to pull off because 
you need a library that it's gonna work, it's gonna accept both and use the public key as a string instead of like, for example, in Java, that's not gonna work because the public key is probably gonna be like uh, a public key object. So if you pass a public key object to an HMAC function, it's like Java is gonna complain. Um, another thing is as part of the header, you have, can have like a key ID. Oh, key ID. I'm missing a slide, sorry. Um, so basically, it's a like people want to sign multiple keys. So what we're going to put is a key ID, key identifier in the header. And when you're a developer, what you do is you take the key ID from the header, you do a lookup in a database, or you do a lookup on the file system to get the key, and then you use that key to verify the signature. The problem is that lookup in the database or that lookup in the, on the file system happens before any crypto is uh, involved. So if you have an injection in the key ID, you can, for example, use an SQL injection to, instead of returning the actual key, returning ha 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 ha. And that's what we can do. So you get a signed token containing a key ID parameter, you decode the header and change the key ID with your injection payload, you tamper with the payload, you sign the token with the return value from the SQL injection, which is pretty cool. Uh, you have to trust me on the cool thing. Uh, uh, so here, yeah. uh, six, I think, yes. So yeah, basically here we're creating a token with uh, algorithm uh, HMAC. A UKI ID is ZZZZ code union select AAAA. The thing is here you use something that you sure doesn't exist in the database so to make sure that this part of the injection is the first result. So the application will use your key. And then you do all your base 64 magic. The important part is here is when you're signing, you use pub, which is the same AAAA as we have here. And you export an SQL injection. You could dump data from the database, but that's a lot less fun. Where this is pretty interesting. And if you copy that token, and you put it here. Oh, probably need to. Uh, did I mess it up? No, I should be all right. Uh, how can I? Hmm. Uh, oh, okay, I'm already logged in. And here I'm admin just by, yeah, using the SQL injection to sign my own information. So that happens, and you can have like directory traversal as well. So when you have directory traversal, what you can do is use uh, dev, uh, dev nil. So this way it returns like an empty string and you use that to sign. Oh, I've it just in the wrong order, but yeah. So that's exactly what I say. Uh, CV 2018-0114 was a bug in uh, Cisco not Jose library. So basically um, in JWT, you can you have a JWK, which is an embedded key in the header. And that's kind of what it looks like. And the idea is that you can tell the receiver that, like, okay, uh, this token was signed with this key and put the actual key in it. But it's a, pub it's a public key. You're not going to put the private key or the secret for the HMAC, hopefully. And what the bug was is that not Jose uh, trusted the embedded key inside the header. So basically, you're telling the library, okay, this is. My JWT, it's signed with the key here, and you should trust it because the signature match is the key that is inside the, uh, the header. So basically, you can forge the full thing. And so you get a token, you tamper with the payload, you generate an RSA key, you add uh, the modulus and the exponent to the header, and use RSA 256, and you sign your token. Uh, let's do that. Just so. Uh, ah. So if we look like, that's pretty simple exploit. It's just like, okay, you get, uh, here I'm not generating the key, I'm using one, but I generated before with OpenSSL, uh, generSA, dash out, key, 2048. And then from that, I get the public key. Then I extract from the public key the exponent and the modulus. Then I put that in the right format in my header. Um, then I encode, encode and sign with the same, with the matching private key, and then I just send the full thing to the application. And 
you got like, yeah, that's an RSA token. But so you can see that it's a bit bigger. Uh, and if I go there, go there. Um, no, no. Uh, yeah, yeah, I get the token. I just replace it. And I get the same thing I'm admin now. Um, which is pretty interesting. Like applied crypto wise, those are pretty cool bugs. Uh, or you, you have to trust me on that. Um, <laughs> when I first read about JWT, uh, so reading RFC, as you do, uh, I, thought, I saw these two things named JKU and X5U. And it's basically a reference to a URL. Uh, JKU is uh, JWKE URL and X5U is X509 URL. And I thought to myself, this is freaking amazing. They're gonna be so, there's going to be so many CSRF bug in that because people are going to just trust that URL. Hey, and no one was using it. Back like it was probably like five years ago or something like that. And now people start using it, so it's really good. So basically, how it works is you got the user, it sends a JWT, the application gets the JWT, pass the JWT with the JKU header, fetch the JWK from a trusted server, uh, pass the JWK, and verify the JWT signature with the JWK. So that's, and then you get a response. Um, uh, if you look at something that could be cool, is say, okay, um, you send your malicious JWT that has a JKU header that you control because this part, again, we need the key to verify the signature, so we're fetching the key, and you go to your malicious server. So that sounds like a pretty sweet deal. The problem is that most people are good enough at computers and they say like, oh, that's a bad idea. Like, yeah, we're gonna have CSRF and like gremlins in our network, so we don't want that. So they blocked it. And you're like, okay. The thing is that people are really bad at filtering URL because it's incredibly hard. Like, yeah, really, really hard. So for example, people are also really bad at regular expression. Uh, one example is like, oh, I'm gonna filter and only accept trusted.example.com. And you say like, okay, they forget to escape the dot in the host name. Or, and then you say like, oh, you register a domain, a few bucks, and then you, go, you uh, can bypass the verification. So that's really common. Uh, people are using start with. Uh, and start with is a really bad way to verify a URL. Very, very bad way. Uh, so it's going to start with trusted. But yeah, it turns out you can do like at pentestolab.com or even add a domain at the end. Or you can, they're going to put that thing, that URL, and you're going to dot dot slash your way out to a file upload. You're going to dot dot slash your way out to an open redirect or even to a header injection. So you can do a lot of things with that. Um, if we look at the open redirect, so it's passing the key, fetching the JWK based on the JKU header on the trusted server. Now, we introduce a open, open redirect. So the open redirect will happen here. So when we're fetching the key, we put a malicious open redirect. So as part of 3A, the application will be redirected to a malicious server. So yeah, open redirect matters. I got a friend who like, does a lot of bug bounty, and he's so annoyed when people report bug uh, open redirect because that's a really good way to chain bug. And if you kill the open redirect, you kill the full chain. And then it's going to fetch the key from the malicious uh, JW key after following the redirect. The important thing is that, and not all libraries do that, is that you need your HTTP library here to follow redirects. And yeah. If you're like a developer or on defensive side, you probably want to limit the number of redirects or prevent libraries from following redirects if you can. Uh, for example, I think the default uh, what, uh, HTTP party, for example, I don't think there wasn't following redirect, so that killed one of the bug I had. But yeah, um, it's going to pass the JWK, and since you have, as a malicious person, you have uh, sign the token with the right key, and this application is using your key to verify the token, you should be in. And yeah, another one, uh, even this is amazing. Um, you, got, you send your JWT with, uh, again, something you sign. The only thing different here is that you got a header injection. So with the header injection, um, the JKU 
contains a header injection to reflect the key, the actual JWK inside the response to this guy. So even if there is like some crazy network filtering, you're still on the trusted server. And then it's passing the key, and then it is verifying the JWK signature using the JWK from the header injection. So we're going to do that. So 11. Um, okay, so we got our little web application and um, we generate like, we use our RSA key, we put, we create the JWK and then what we're going to do, the magic is here, we're going to create the URL using the header injection, so that's the header injection, we're going to include a connection close to close the connection properly, then uh, line, then content length with the size of our JWK, and then the actual JWK in the page. So, and then we're just signing a token, right? We have done that many times. So we're going to just run that. So that's pretty big uh, export. So what we can do first is look at that. So that's the application with the header injection. And here we can see that using the header injection, we're injecting the full key uh, in the response of the server. And if we then copy the last line with everything, and we paste it here, we get, yeah, we solve this challenge, blah, blah, blah. And yeah, but, but yeah, and that's a full, so that's a pretty big token, yeah. And so yeah, that's a good way to chain bugs. And again, the main reason is that this fetching of the JKU happens before any crypto is involved. So that's why it's such an interesting bug. Um, another bug with that is um, if you start reviewing JWT libraries, as you do, uh, the RFC calls out and forcing TLS to avoid money in the middle, obviously. But few implementations get it wrong. Uh, few implementations make sure that the URL starts with HTTPS when they create the token, not when they verify it. So as an attacker, you can submit a URL with HTTP and it's gonna go through because it's only when they create the token because they didn't understand the RFC properly. And yeah, uh, another library, JavaScript library, um, just always fetch uh, the key regardless. And even if it's, so they got a white list of uh, uh, we got a valid list of URL they trust, and regardless of if they trust the URL or not, they're still fetching it just in case. So yeah, and they return like two different results if whether it's uh, so uh, even more interesting. What they do is they return two results, two uh, boolean. One is whether the signature is valid, and the other one is whether it's trusted. So they're gonna tell. So sometimes if you sign with an untrusted URL but you sign properly, one of these boolean is true. So like it's pretty confusing if you're developing. And yeah, so that's probably not a good pattern to follow. Uh, some conclusion. So first, make sure you use strong keys and secret. Don't store them in your source code. Make sure you have key rotation built in. Um, review the library you pick. Try to like find a library that is simple because the more algorithms are supported, the more likely people are gonna shoot themselves in the foot. Uh, make sure you check the signature. It's pretty easy to do that. Like just basically for the code, change the value. If the, C the value is still accepted, it's pretty bad. Um, make sure your tokens expire. That's pretty often that people create token and they sign it and they're valid forever. And you need to verify that they expire for every single server. So every single mi microservices need to verify this signature. Uh, enforce the algorithm if you can. Some library let you do that. Say like, okay, um, I'm gonna, since we're only signing a uh, token with HMAC, we are only gonna accept HS256. Um, what else? Yeah. And yeah, durability are complex and insecure by design. Uh, people are working on something new named Pazetto, which is supposed to be a lot more robust, robust than uh, JWT. And like, basically JWT comes from this idea of like crypto agility and yeah, it used to be cool to do crypto agility, woo, like being agile. And the problem is that people realized that it was a terrible idea. 
And <laughs> now, yeah, I'm not joking. Uh, because, yeah, the more protocol you support and the more thing you support, the more, then, the more likely you're going to have bugs. That's not so that surprising. Um, and yeah, JWT library introduced very, very interesting bugs. Like if you want to do code review or security review, and like look at JWT, it's amazing. Like, yeah. So yeah, as I said, I teach uh, web hacking. And basically, I think I got like 13 challenges on JWT because that's the number of cool bugs you can find with them. Um, yeah, and make sure you test for those if you write code, pen test, or do bug bounties because like, yeah, a lot of bugs in those, yeah. And a lot of cool stuff to do. And yeah, thanks for your time. And if you have any questions, we have plenty of time. Okay, any questions? Great talk. Uh, love the intersection of crypto bugs identified through AppSec Lens. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much. Uh, my first question is, uh, you talk about um, kind of finding the entropy of JW JWT secret uh, yep. by doing source code review. Um, what if... Uh, yeah. What if you know I'm a one-person AppSec team and I have to deal with hundreds of microservices going live in two weeks sprint? Yep. Is there a way to uh, scale this type of identification? Like, can we do yep. entropy analysis S uh, with Ashcat? If if I were you, if I had like two weeks to do that, I will buy. I will spend the first two days buying a big computer. And, <laughs> <laughs> and with a lot of graphic cards in it. And then, uh, where was it? Uh, Ashcat somewhere. So Ashcat, yeah, this one. And then I will like get a token for every single microservice. But so I will get a token from all microservices, and then I will put that in Ashcat and get it cracking. The good thing is that most of the time, JWT are signed and verified by systems that rely on each other, so they should have the same secret. Okay. Yep. Great. Hopefully. Thank you. Uh, I have one more question. <laughs> Uh, you talked about crypto agility, yep. uh, you know, in this agile world, everybody wants to move fast and they want yep. to have mechanisms to change things. So how to really strike a balance between crypto agility and security? Thank you. Wow. Uh. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Yeah. Good escape. <laughs> um, next year. Yeah, next year. No, I think... Um, Crypto is something that needs to be done slowly and yeah, or you should get, you should not, yeah. Um, the main problem here is the crypto agility in terms of protocol, but if you want to move fast, you just kind of rely on those. You don't, yeah, you don't need to um, have crypto agility if you move fast. You can move fast and have crypto that is not agile and that works fine, yeah. Hopefully that's an answer. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Is there any other questions? Uh, thanks for the uh, presentation. Uh, I have a question. Um, do you have any uh, recommendation as the um, like uh, recommendation for uh, the JOT library to, to use as the strongest? Um, depends on what language you're using. Uh, the one from um, Atlassian has one that is supposed to be pretty good. And we got a pretty good security team, so I would trust them on that. Um, yeah, number of stars on GitHub can be a good indicator, but not always is. Um, I think I would make sure that you can define, uh, you can limit the number of algorithms used. That's probably a big issue. Um, you can, but they don't have support for JWK in the header. That's something you don't want. Um, and try to find something that is not too big and too complex so you can review it if needed. And yeah. But yeah, I think the one from Atlassian is supposed to be pretty good. Okay, we have another question. Just quickly, Louis, uh, great presentation. Um, one point about key rotation, yep. I guess. Uh, like, so I think my experience with that is you rotate keys when something bad happens and probably the design didn't consider that in the first place. Is there something in the standards that, you know, help ascertain you know how to rotate keys particularly in massively distributed systems and data centers like not that's, at all right. like as in even so even the better. developers and engineers need to essentially come up with that yeah that's the point as well and the point is that oh i guess 
-hmm. Yeah, none of, the, none of the library I looked at had support for multiple keys built in. Because you can imagine like having two keys and like you use one and you fail back to the other one mm -hmm. if the first one doesn't work. And none of the library was doing that natively, so you need to build that yourself. And most of the time it's too late when you need to rotate them and yeah. Okay, thank you. Perfect, thanks. Thanks.